doctors in England. But on the other hand, it has to balance this difficult issue of guidelines with the need for individualised patient care, for patient-centred care. And so it's a great pleasure, therefore, to welcome Professor Haslam, who will tell us the secret of how you can square that circle. So no problem there at all, Professor Haslam. Good afternoon. The secret, I've got to share a secret with you. Um, well, the secret I'll share with you is never in my wildest dreams as a family physician in the countryside in the east of England did I think one day I'd be standing in Bahrain addressing an audience like this. It's just wonderful to be here. I'm very flattered and honored that you, you are here. I've, I've been in Bahrain since uh, my plane landed at 8.30 on Saturday night. So that's how much expertise I have about this country, is um, I fly home at 2.15 tomorrow morning. I have a meeting in London at 9.30 tomorrow morning. I sometimes think I'm crazy, but never mind. Um, I've had a guided tour of uh, the organization here, and I have to say I am very jealous um, when I look back at my student days as a medical student, the facilities you have uh, are wonderful, and I, I really am I'm very jealous. Now, you've, you've all heard uh, about guidelines. Many of you will have used guidelines. Um, NICE, my organization that I'm, I'm chair of, is probably the world's foremost uh, producer of guidelines. We're, uh, I was trying to count up how many countries I've visited to talk about guidelines. It's about 20 now. Um, many, many countries are interested in the way we work. Many doctors around the world use our guidelines. So I thought it was useful to talk a little bit about how they're produced, um, why they're produced, and uh, how, you, how you best should use them. And the reason I think we need guidelines is it's absolutely, I'm, I'm sorry to tell you this, it is impossible to know everything there is to know about medicine. Um, they used to say laughingly in, in the UK that the only day of your career you know everything about medicine is the day you qualify. Uh, and then after that, I, it just it gets, it's so difficult to keep up to date. There is so much information being published all the time. Uh, there was a study from Scandinavia which said that if a generalist doctor every night of the year were to read two research papers that were relevant to being a doctor, at the end of a year of reading, they'd be 500 years behind in their reading because there's so much being published, there's so much. So you need somebody to do the reading for you, to synthesize it, to present it uh, in a way that's useful. Um, and, and the reason that anybody produces guidelines, I've listed here. First of all, to try and address the variation in care that there can be. Now, you've probably started to observe this. You work with one doctor who does something one way, and then you work with another doctor who does something slightly different, and you begin to wonder why this is, and there may be good reasons for that. I don't want every doctor in the world to do exactly the same thing, but we need to understand why there are variations. There are treatments that go on being used when they're no longer effective. Um, we see this uh, almost everywhere in the world. The research has come out, been very clear that this particular treatment is no longer useful and yet it still goes on being used. Um, we need to understand which treatments are both effective and cost effective. Uh, there isn't an infinite amount of money out there to, to spend on healthcare, so you need to know what's going to, be, going to be useful. You need to be able to take on board the new developments and know about them. And a big change that's happening in many countries, and I've no idea how much this is happening in Bahrain, is patients. Patients are very interested in their healthcare. Um, after all, it's their body, it's their illness. Why wouldn't they be? When I was a family doctor, I remember one of my own patients coming to see me and saying, uh, Dr. Haslam, I've been looking at the NICE website and uh, you've got me on the wrong treatment. Now, I thought, I, I genuinely, I thought, gosh, that's, I'm, 
I, I wasn't irritated. I honestly wasn't irritated. I was really, uh, it's his body, it's his interest, um, and he shared the information with me, and he was right. And we changed his treatment. Now, I think we're going to see this more and more. Uh, in, many in some countries more than others, but patients are really interested in what quality care looks like. Uh, and they're going to say to their doctors, one day they're going to say to you, why are you treating me with that? Why aren't you using this? And you need to be able to understand that. And as I've said, it's pretty well impossible for any of us to keep up to date with absolutely everything that's published. Um, so, for a long time, there have been guidelines produced. Many countries around the world have produced uh, guidelines on best, best practice. Um, and one of the commonest ways that they were produced in the past is what I call the uh, BOGSAT method, which stands for bunch of guys sitting at a table. Uh, fundamentally, a group of senior clinicians will often sit around and they'll talk to each other and say, what's best practice and they'll write down what they do and then you'll that'll be passed down to, to their juniors and on, onwards doesn't necessarily mean they're right uh, we also see and have seen in the past an awful lot of guidance that has been sponsored that has been produced and paid for and it often looks beautiful it's printed beautifully multicolor lots of logos produced perhaps by a pharmaceutical company um, and they uh, produce guidance on the management of a condition which, surprise, surprise, recommends using their treatment. So internationally, a bunch of criteria have been built up that allow you to look at whether guidelines are something that can be trusted. And these are called the AGREE criteria. Uh, and these very much apply to, to what NICE does, but I thought I'd just say a little bit more about the way NICE produces any of our guidelines. We always, always, always work on evidence. We work on the evidence that's been published in peer-reviewed journals, which may be randomized double-blind control trials. It may be other forms of evidence. We work, the committee that draws up the guidance on a particular subject will always have experts on it, expert clinicians, doctors or nurses or allied health professionals who have real expertise. Equally important, it'll have patients on it. Because we think as doctors that we're the ones who are managing the condition. But actually it's the patient who lives with it 24 hours a day uh, and really understands what it's like to have the condition. Uh, and so patients are a critical part of, of all the work that we do. Um, and one of the really important things we address is conflicts of interest. So we make it absolutely clear that nobody who works on one of our guidelines uh, has a conflict of interest, which means maybe they've been paid to give lectures around the world by a drug company, or uh, their university is, has a huge research grant from a particular company, or something like that. Because that, it may not make them, um, it may not make them produce bad guidance, but it might make readers not trust it. And we absolutely have to be trusted. The work that NICE does is of real importance to, uh, to our healthcare system. Uh, and we need people to trust us. Uh, and so by, by being absolutely sure that no one can say, the reason you said that in your guidance is because one of your committee got money for it. Uh, we absolutely are really, really tough on that. So when we use guidelines, uh, this is uh, what they are and what they're not. What they are. Um, is they describe what good care should look li like and they absolutely take into account the patient's view of things and as I've said they're absolutely based on the best evidence. They're not, they are not, they are not instructions that tell you you must treat every patient this way. Um, they don't replace your clinical judgment um, and they're not a textbook. I'm afraid it doesn't cover absolutely everything. And in every lecture I give, I always use this same slide. I say they're guidelines, they're not tram lines. They are guides to what the best practice is. Now, why aren't they instructions? Wouldn't it make your life much, much easier if we told you what to do? Well, 
that would be fine if you were treating robots rather than patients. Patients are very complicated. Patients have different expectations of what you're going to do, different aspirations. Um, and every piece of guidance, I, kn I know you can't read this next slide, and I hate it when lecturers say that, but I'm going to read this to you. Well, I'd read it if I could manage it. Um, th we print in all our guidelines these words. The recommendations in this guideline represent the view of NICE arrived at after considerable, co careful consideration of the evidence available. When exercising their judgment, professionals are expected to take this fully into account alongside the individual, in other words, the patient's needs, preferences, and values. The application of the recommendations in this guideline is not mandatory, and the guideline does not not override the professional responsibility of the healthcare professional to make decisions appropriate to the circumstances of the individual patient. In other words, you have to find out what matters to your patient, and I'll say more about this in, in future. Um, I was talking to another group earlier today about uh, a patient in the UK, uh, a woman who was completely demented to the extent she didn't recognize any of her family member. Um, she had a stroke and broke her hip as she had the stroke and was admitted to hospital. And whilst in hospital, the junior doctor, she was 96, demented. Whilst in hospital, she was started on a statin. And when she was, the, the doctor who started the treatment was challenged, the doctor said, well, that, what's, that's what the guidelines say you have to do. No, what the guidelines say you have to do is to take into account the individual patient. What are you actually trying to do in a demented 96-year-old with a statin? Prevent them having a heart attack at the age of 112? So it's really a question of, of taking on board the real individual patient. Um, so that's, that's I, I cannot tell you how important that is. But also, I'm equally clear that you should follow guidelines unless there's a good reason not to. And I'm going to come back to that a little bit in a, in a minute. Um, not all clinicians do follow all our guidance all the time. That's no surprise, is it? Sometimes they don't know about it. Um, sometimes they say there is poor uh, support or there's not enough funding available. Um, occasionally, people don't trust the guidelines. But I've tried to make it really, really clear that with the guidelines we produce and accredited guideline producers around the world, if they really have addressed things like conflict of interest and have worked with experts and worked with evidence, you can trust them. Now I'm going to just move on now to another really big challenge to, to all of us, and that's the issue of multimorbidity. An awful lot of what you've learned, I, well, I'm guessing this, I don't know how your course is arranged, but m most students I meet around the world are talk about, taught about the heart, about the lungs, the brain, the mental health issues, all separate conditions. But our patients uh, are different. Um, you've probably seen graphs like this, which show uh, the incredible change in life expectancy. So in almost every area of the world, People are getting, each year, life expectancy is going up and up and up, which is on one level, well, on many levels, especially when you're my age, it's a wonderful thing that people can get older. Um, but what it means is that there are many, many more people who have multiple conditions. And what this chart here shows, across the bottom we've got age range, so 0 to 4, 5 to 9, and so on. And each colored band um, is the number of long-term conditions that particular group has. So obviously, young children, most of them don't have any long-term conditions. But as you get older, you start, most people or many people start to collect more and more long-term conditions. So by the time you're 70 or 80, there are lots of people with a multiplicity of, of healthcare problems. I had a patient in my own practice, uh, a man, uh, he was uh, in his 60s, and he had coronary artery disease, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, chronic kidney disease, diabetes, macular degeneration, osteoarthritis, and depression. I'm not surprised he had depression. 
Um, so uh, it's, that is not unusual, a list that long. Um, and one of the problems we have is that healthcare in many countries has not yet taken notice of that. So we're still treating the individual conditions. And if you think of that patient of mine with eight conditions, what does good care look like for that person? What I don't think it looks like, even though I'm chairman of NICE, I don't think it looks like taking eight NICE guidelines and adding those together. Because we'll end up then with patients on huge numbers of treatments taking um, most of their life in being involved in medical checks. And my theory is that, that healthcare, oh, sorry, there's another chart here which I sadly I'm going to skip over unless I don't think you can see enough. But what, basically what this chart shows, down the side we've got different conditions and the likelihood of having other conditions with it. And I can give you an example. Uh, if you've got, let's take one of them, hypertension, 22% of patients with hypertension will only have hypertension. Most of what you've been taught about hypertension is about hypertension. 24% will have one other long-term condition. Another 19% will have two more long-term conditions. 35% uh, will have three or more long-term conditions. Again, it makes everything uh, much more confusing. Uh, and part of, part of what's going on here is that healthcare, I think, in many countries, was organized for about 50 years to treat infectious diseases, things like uh, tuberculosis and, and acute infections. And then we, we went through a phase. Much of my career was involved with treating single conditions. Patients would be admitted to hospital. They'd either get better or they'd die. They'd go home. Healthcare almost finished. And we're now dealing with a completely different era, that of long-term conditions. Um, there are more people in the United Kingdom with two or more long-term conditions than there are with one long-term condition. Yet most healthcare, apart from family medicine and some care of the elderly, is organized around one condition at a time. So as I said, trying to work out what good care looks like for a patient means absolutely putting the patient at the center of this. Um, absolutely using the evidence, using the guidelines, using the recommendations, uh, but really trying to find out from the patient what matters to them. We know that the average person in the UK aged 70 will be on nine different medications. Unfortunately, there's very little research that tells you how nine medications mix together, what the side effects are. The risks, particular to the elderly, of more and more medication, the risks of postural hypotension, falls, fractures, indeed death from overtreatment is a really significant one. So this is why it's, it's extraordinarily important, um, in my mind, to take notice of, of, of this. And this is why NICE more and more is trying to focus on uh, the individual patient. The other thing that we've tried to do is develop um, a methodology called shared decision making. So encouraging doctors not to tell their patients what, particularly when it comes to long-term conditions, what they need to take, but to share the problem with their, pa their patients. For instance, taking statins. Um, the whole question of whether it's worth taking a statin is a decision that the patient needs to take. Um, the, the, some of the long-term preventative treatments, we've produced really clear basic statistics that allow patients to see what's the individual benefit likely to be to them, and then they can decide, is it worth it or isn't it worth it? But I think many of us sort of o overestimate the benefit to our individual patients, and we just go on adding more, and you've probably all seen patients on multiple treatments, more and more and more. And we have to start thinking about what are we really trying to achieve for the patients. And the other thing I just can't un uh, overestimate enough is the, the importance in all of this of kindness and of compassion and caring for patients. So, there's an awful lot of science in medicine, but there's an awful lot of art as well, and it's extraordinarily important um, that we, we focus on this. And within NICE, we've developed some guidelines now uh, for multimorbidity. 
for people with multiple healthcare conditions, uh, more than anything, trying to encourage clinicians to think about the real patient that they're treating, the real importance of focusing on that individual. Now, my problem when I come to a, a, a different country is I don't know what matters to you, uh, and I don't know what problems you face, and I don't know um, whether you use guidelines, how you use guidelines, and I think it would be much more useful if, rather than me teaching much more, if I listened to any questions that you have, and we try and address any challenges, anything that you've come across in guidelines uh, that might be helpful. So uh, I'm more than happy to take any questions. Um, if there are none, I mean, we know exactly what will happen, but I can't believe there won't be any. So, yes. Hi. I have a question about um, antibiotic resistance specifically because it's becoming such um, a big issue for clinicians that are uh, coming into the field, so much so that uh, the West, uh, Europe, even the Middle East is holding summits on this particular issue. And I was wondering how um, the NICE guidelines or whether they have uh, taken this into account in formulating their guidelines on uh, antibiotic prescription and stewardship specifically. Absolutely. Extraordinarily important question. The chief medical officer in England, the senior doctor for the health service in England, describes the problem of antibiotic resistance as a probable apocalypse. Uh, that if we don't sort this problem out, the, the real genuine danger of, minor surg of, of relatively minor surgical procedures no longer being safe, uh, of people uh, dying from what would be now easily treatable conditions. So uh, NICE has produced, uh, we've done work around antimicrobial prescribing. More than anything, we've just set up a group to look at common uh, pres prescriptions for common conditions, particularly aimed at family physicians. Uh, so we published one last week on the treatment of sinusitis, sinus infections. Uh, for most of my professional career, sinusitis has been treated with antibiotics uh, for many years with tetracyclines, then with broad spectrum penicillins and so on. There is absolutely no evidence that this makes any difference at all. Indeed, there's absolutely no evidence that anything makes any difference at all. Um, the guidelines also looked at things like nasal de decongestants. At the, there's a traditional treatment that's used in the UK, but I suspect it's far too hot here, of inhaling, you put a bowl of steam and a towel over your head and sniff the steam up. Now, some people are nodding. There's absolutely no evidence that that works, but more than anything, there's no evidence that, uh, uh, that antibiotics work. So there's a real encouragement not to use antibiotics. Now, I, I'm not here to make your life easier. I'm here to make it, uh, the, the, It'd be lovely if I made your life easier, but one of the challenges, of course, is sepsis. And so we've also recently had a, a real recognition in the UK of a problem of patients who are admitted to hospital and not early enough have sepsis diagnosed. And there's a significant number of thousands of deaths per year from untreated infections. Why doesn't this make life easy? Because the easiest way to prevent that is to give everybody antibiotics. The quickest way to get to an antibiotic-resistant apocalypse is to give everybody antibiotics. So I think the secret has to come down to much better diagnostic criteria for knowing when you really do need antibiotics. The other thing NICE is doing is working with countries around the world to try and adapt our guidance for different countries. Um, and one example that I'm going to run with, though I've been told it might not be strictly accurate, is in New Zealand, where in, South New in the southern island of New Zealand, um, the evidence that NICE uses for not using antibiotics for throat infections is entirely appropriate. In the North Island, particularly in Auckland, where there's a large population of Samoans, there is a very high incidence, or believed to be a high incidence, of rheumatic fever. And so Samoans with a sore throat are encouraged to go to their doctor to receive penicillin. So you can see the complexity and the importance of focusing guidance on the, on the actual population. So the short answer to your question is yes, we take it really seriously. We're trying to produce more and more guidance on uh, uh, not using antibiotics when they're not needed. Um, 
And the other, the other big pressure in this is, of course, patient expectation. I was in Beijing in China last year, and, patient, and I was shown a photograph of a clinic in Beijing, uh, an outpatient uh, emergency room clinic. And there was this long row of women, middle-aged women, in their outdoor clothes with a cigarette in one hand and their sleeve rolled up in the other arm with an intravenous drip in, receiving antibiotics for their colds. Because the health beliefs in many parts of China are that you need intravenous antibiotic to manage a cold. So understanding the beliefs of the population that you're working with, and in Bahrain, that's going to be different to the UK, you have to address those. Um, and one of the important things is to find out what your patient expects and then talk about that if you're not going to do it rather than leave, let them leave the room thinking, that's a useless doctor. You know, but that doesn't mean you have to give antibiotics. Okay, anything else? You can see I can talk forever on a question if you sort of uh, throw one at me. David, yeah. Yeah. In any, one of the problems people have as a, as a doctor uh, is trying to balance the use of guidelines with individualized patient care. And of course, one of the things that happens in consulting rooms is that you get computer screens flashed up, uh, often with a lot of uh, official guidelines or questions. Have you done this? Have you I said earlier that I recognize that it's almost impossible for any of us to take on board all the inf information that we need. However brilliant you guys are, just taking all the new information on board all the time. So we're going to need information technology. We're going to need computer systems to, rep uh, to, uh, to help us. Now, the earliest clinical programs that we used in the UK, particularly in primary care, developed templates so, for instance, if you have a patient with diabetes who comes, comes in, when you've entered the word diabetes into the system, up comes a box saying, check their foot pulses, do their reflexes, look in their eyes, have you done this, have you done that? And you have to work through the list. And we have those templates for, uh, for every condition. I remember a patient of mine, uh, a man uh, aged about 52, who came in to see me for a blood pressure check. And um, I got him to roll up his sleeve, and I put the sphygmomanometer on, and then I started to fill in the template. And I was looking at the computer screen, and suddenly out of the corner of my eye, I realized he was crying. And so I actually turned the computer off, turned to him, apologized, and said, I am sorry, what's up? And he came to talk to me about what he was frightened about, which was actually his wife being seriously ill. There is a real danger of being seduced by the technology, of the computer being the thing that tells you what to do. Computers are there as an aid to us, to help us remember. But they're not, it's not the computer having the consultation with you, it's the patient. There's really interesting research about consultations that shows that in the UK and in the USA, the average doctor will interrupt the patient after 14 seconds. In other words, the patient starts to tell their story. I bet you've all done this. They start to tell you about their headache. And about 14 seconds in, you start to throw in questions. So which side is it? And uh, do you get blurred vision? The evidence is that if you shut up for two minutes, you'll get most of the story. So incredibly important. Your patient comes in with a condition, your computer's flashing at you, it's saying, your patient with diabetes needs these doing and you've forgotten to do this, and by the way, they haven't had a tetanus for 10 years and something else and something else. Forget all that, talk to your patient, or don't even talk, listen to your patient, find out what matters to them, then do the rest of it. Extraordinarily important. 
most of you are lucky enough, I suspect, to be healthy. Uh, but if you talk, if you go to your doctors or your family tell you about their experience of going to doctors, over and over again, they will say, in the UK, they say things like, the doctor was more interested in the computer than he or she was in me. Please don't be one of those doctors. Okay, questions. We have a lot of yep. What I don't want you to do is go home this evening and say, I wish I'd asked him whatever it is, sir. Just on that note of the doctor being more interested with the computer than the patient, uh, you tell us the evidence shows that we do stay quiet for two minutes, but if you share the story, um, we'll probably get most of what we need to you know, reach a differential. But this has to do with more medical education and guidelines, but the way we're taught here, we're sort of molded into that. You need to be like quick fire, get what you need for the exam, you have know, five minutes, seven minutes, eight minutes, whatever you want to call whatever time you need to take history. So do you see, you know, any solutions? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. The 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 uh, it's a the, the, the question the if you're being marked if the, met, if the metric of whether your consultation was successful is, did you get all the questions in you needed to ask, then the way to do it is just talk to the patient. You know, question, 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 question. If you want to find out what's wrong with the patient, let them talk. And actually, the evidence is they will cover most of these areas uh, in, in the two. And I'm not, please, I'm not saying set your watch and sit there in silence for two minutes. What I'm saying is, um, is, is absolutely just let them explain what they're worried about. So, you know, the patient with a headache, well, I get this terrible headache and it comes on and, and uh, I've noticed that it's, uh, it lasts about a few hours and it comes on, you know, every Tuesday and, and just let them get that out and then you won't need to ask half those questions. Um, now, not, not all your patients are going to guarantee to deliver the, uh, the full story to you all the time, but, but enough will. It's, it's really, it's well worth trying, and again, the evidence, and I come from an evidence base, says that that's the way to, to get there. Another one here? Oh, two, great, I love this. The, this is what always happens, there's never anybody, and then there's a stream, so that's good. Hi. Yeah. You mentioned how um, in current times patients tend to have multiple comorbidities rather than one condition. But then we've also noticed that um, lately um, specialties have become more and more specialized. Mm. So it's kind of like a paradox. We have less patients with one condition and doctors with very specific specialties. So just yeah, I think it's absolutely fascinating, absolutely fascinating. And I, it really uh, intrigues me because uh, we are going to have, uh, the more we understand genomics, the more we understand that what appear to be common conditions are multi multiplicities of rare conditions, the more we're going to need experts to understand the rarities of that particular subset of the condition. And yet, take my patient with his eight conditions, or if you subdivide those, it could be 16 conditions, if we really understood it. Are they going to have to go and see 16 different specialists? Are they really, is that going to be the way forward? So I, my, my thought about the future is very much that we're going to need um, many, many more generalist doctors who really take into account the whole of the patient's uh, needs, but with expert consultants that they can consult for advice when needed on the specific topic areas. The Royal College of Physicians in London uh, recently did a report looking at the future of the hospital sector in the UK, said what we need more than anything are more generalists. We don't need any more specialists. Uh, the Royal College of Surgeons, I, the last three presidents of the Royal College of Surgeons, which is the main body for surgery in the UK, has said to me, what we need is many more general surgeons. Um, but medical careers have gone in the opposite direction. And the question isn't, 
what do you guys want? To, I'm sorry, the question isn't what, what do you want to do? It's what does your population need? And what your population is going to need is many more generalists. The other really interesting thing is around the world that uh, the evidence shows that investment in primary care and in family medicine, um, you get, uh, certainly you reduce health inequalities and maximize health outcomes if the input is put into primary care rather than secondary or tertiary care. In most countries in the world, the opposite happens. Um, one of the, uh, the examples of this, I, I remember talking to one of our senior politicians in the UK who was really excited about a new treatment for heart attacks that had been introduced. And he said to me, you know, David, isn't it fantastic that within, within half an hour of uh, his patient, his, one of his uh, friends having a heart attack, that, that person had been admitted to hospital and had a stent fitted and all the rest. And I said, yes, it's fantastic. It's absolutely marvelous. But even better would have been that patient not having a heart attack. And he said, what do you mean? And I said, well, if you invest sufficiently in primary care and you control that person's blood pressure and their cholesterol and smoking and exercise and alcohol and all the rest, he probably wouldn't have had a heart attack. And every single one of you would rather not have a heart attack than have it treated effectively. But there's no story there, is there? There's nothing exciting about not having a heart attack. There is something exciting about treating a heart attack with fantastic technology and big machines and so on. So again, it's a question of the healthcare system working out, are we trying to do the exciting stuff or the effective stuff? And you need both. So you're, I'm really interested in your question. I'm not quite, I suspect artificial intelligence is gonna become an increasing part of the future. I'm often asked to go and speak to conferences about the future of healthcare. And I can give that talk for about a minute because I have absolutely no idea what's, what's coming. Um, which nobody, 15 years ago, nobody 15 years ago would have imagined the impact of the smartphone. I bet every one of you has got a smartphone in your pocket. You have access to all the knowledge in the world in your pocket. 15 years ago, we would have thought that was ridiculous to even think of that. What on earth will we have invented in 15 years? But what I do know is that if you look at classical literature going back centuries, people have always been frightened and lonely and needed skilled care when they've been frightened and lonely and ill. And for me, I think the future of an awful lot of medicine is gonna combine the very best of the technology with the very best of the humanity. It's not gotta be an either or, it's gotta be both. And I suspect artificial intelligence will become a major part of that. But I'm pretty certain that every one of you is more expert on that than I am. There was another question in the front here. Yeah. Um, so if these conflicts you, uh, are actually there, um, how should they be handled by physicians? Um, so a so question about well, why should you believe ours rather than anybody else's is effectively what you're saying. Uh, well, I, I, what I'm saying is the important thing if you use guidelines is um, to be sure that you can trust them. And there are a number of excellent guideline producers around the world. I'm absolutely not saying that NICE is the, it's the only one. It's one of the best known. Um, there are some excellent American guidelines. There's, even within the United Kingdom, the, in Scotland, they produce the Scottish Intercollegiate Guideline Network produces excellent guidelines. The critical thing is being sure you can trust them. And this is where, more than anything, the issue of conflicts of interest comes in, to be absolutely sure that the guidelines you're looking at weren't sponsored by someone. Um, because an awful lot of guidelines in the past have been. They've been sponsored by a pharmaceutical company. Uh, and, uh, and that doesn't mean you can't trust a word anyone says from the pharmaceutical, but you just have to ask if they recommend a particular treatment, um, is there an ulterior motive for that? So the, it's trust is the critical thing. So uh, I, I can guarantee you can trust NICE guidelines. There are other ones that will have been looked at. Those criteria I showed you earlier, the AGREE criteria, um, my slides have all gone funny, but um, No, they've disappeared. If you, look for, if you look for that mark on a guideline, 
uh, generally that will tell you that uh, that's something you can trust. And if it says something different to nice, well, that's interesting, isn't it? I mean, it's, that's the way life is. It's, um, science is constantly changing. Um, I heard someone on British radio the other day phone in and say, why can't these scientists just make their mind up? Well, the simple fact is science is never going to make its mind up because that's what science does. It's constantly questioning and challenging. There was a question in the front, or oh, two questions in the front, but I'm going to take this one first. Yeah, I mean, NICE, uh, when, when we produce guidance in NICE, uh, economic, the, the health economics is very much taken into account. Uh, we're very interested in whether something is not just effective but cost effective. Uh, we try and take into account the implementation cost as well. <coughs> Excuse me. Because there's no point in making recommendations that are completely unrealistic. Um, this, the guideline production, which is what I've talked about, which I, is what I thought you'd be most interested in, is only part of our work. The other major part of NICE's work is we look at uh, new drugs that come onto the market to determine whether the extra cost is justified by the benefit they bring. Because new drugs are constantly getting more expensive, and the question is, is that money worth it? What each of you would ask when you buy anything, and we do that on, for the sake of the health service in the UK, which is very... And quite, quite frequently, I have to say, the benefit isn't sufficient. So yes, we take cost very much into cost and implementation very much into account. Yeah. This is what happens when you don't pass it to a student. That's the. Uh... Absolutely. Well, I focused, I had to take a focus today. Uh, NICE's work uh, involves uh, not just producing these guidelines, but producing public health guidelines for the, uh, the UK system. So focusing on issues like smoking, alcohol, um, uh, exercise, and so on. So we produce a lot of guidance. Now that is, I suspect, much more culturally specific to the UK than perhaps the use of clinical guidelines, which is why I haven't talked about it. The other thing we all have to realize, and I'm sorry that you know, all of us in medicine have to accept that, is the social determinants of health are actually probably more important than anything any of us will do. So education, poverty, these sort of issues are what really drives uh, people's health. We have to have boundaries somewhere around the work we do, so we do public health guidance. We don't get into those really complex areas of levels of education and poverty. Um, but they, they are critically important, much more important than doctors. Sorry. So, if there's anyone over there who wants to ask anything, it's just I might have a scotoma and I'm not quite picking you up. So I'm, I'm seeing these people, but just wave at me if you want to. So, yeah, there's one behind. There was one here again. Yeah. Just on that, why aren't doctors more involved in that aspect? Sure, I'm not sure the word politics, but certainly because that then gets quite, uh, but certainly involved in the organized. Some of us will get involved in politics. I'm very involved in politics. That's not going to be to everyone's taste. 
I'm very interested, if you look at healthcare systems around the world and the benefits they get for the money that they spend, one of the worst is the United States, which spends around about 19% of its gross domestic product on healthcare, and its outcomes are fantastic for some and terrible for others. One of the best, intriguingly, is Cuba, which spends very little but has remarkable outcomes, uh, based around, fundamentally based around primary care and prevention. And uh, young doctors who are appointed to work in a village, maybe the first thing they'll do is ensure the water supply is clean. Now, you may not feel that that's part of your job. It's, a, it's one of those things you can debate till late into the night. Um, but if, if what we're interested in is driving health, then yes, that's incredibly important. If we're interested, as some of us need to be, in treating disease, then it's another, it's another area. I don't think it's an all, some of us will do one, some will do the other. Some of us will fun, be in a funny world that overlaps them. I saw your fist go up when I said Cuba, so I went. <laughs> there was a question here somewhere, yeah. Oh, they're the scary ones. First of all, how do you make sure that doctors are up to date with the guidelines? How do, how do I make sure? That doctors are up to, up to date with the guidelines. And um, do you have the guidelines in different languages? Because, for example, people in Africa, they're poor, and they probably speak one language, and um, it's very, some of them, they don't, know, they don't know how to speak in English. So is there, like, like are the guidelines in different languages? Okay, um, how do I know doctors are up to date with the guidance? I don't. I know the guidance is up to date, or as up to date as we possibly can make it. Uh, the whole question of doctors' usage of guidance is a, another area of discussion. Uh, I would urge all of you at this stage of your careers to work out a way that you're going to keep up to date in whatever your field, field is going to be. Uh, I certainly encourage, when I talk to hospitals, encourage them to at least be organized so someone in the organization is responsible for keeping an eye on our website and what's coming out so that they can pass the information on to the relevant clinicians. Um, those who practice in a sort of smaller units are going to have to work out ways, but there's no way I or we can work can guarantee that, but that's up to both individuals and the education system. Things like chronic, uh, chronic <laughs> that's an interesting Freudian slip, chronic professional development, I mean continuing professional development, become important. Um, so it's, and the second question you asked about languages, no, we, we produce in the English language only. Uh, NICE is working with a number of countries around the world um, to take our guidance and contextualize it for their own countries, but it's not, we're funded by the British Department of Health to produce products for, for our country. The fact is that lots of other countries are really interested. Um, and I know uh, there, are, there are adaptations and translations and things like that happen, but, but some countries are working with us to try and make sure we get that right for them. But it's not something we can do, unfortunately. How many languages would you do? That's the, how are we doing? Any more over here? Yeah, one at the front, keeping you fit. Hi. Hi. I just had a question uh, regarding, um, in terms of the chronic diseases that really don't have a cure and with the treatments that are available, there's inconclusive research. How does NICE develop the guidelines for that, and how accurate and reliable is that as well? Okay. Um, so there's two two really interesting questions within that. Um, long-term conditions that don't have a cure, and you flagged up the word research, and one of the great problems about so much research that is carried out is that it, ex well, there's two, two, two or three big problems. One is m many researchers exclude patients with comorbidities and exclude patients over 65 huge amount of published research will take those two exclusion criteria because it makes the work much easier. There is a problem from that in that most patients who consult their doctors are over 65 and have comorbidities. So immediately you've, you've selected a subgroup which is less representative. I can understand why it's done and it makes much tidier science. The other problem with research is it tends to have this publication bias that it publishes positive rather than negative. 
So there's an awful lot of research that's carried out that shows such and such treatment isn't very effective, but it tends not to be published so much because a lot of journals just think that's all a bit boring. Um, so the, the bias of publications is towards things that look new and impressive, whereas actually if we got a complete picture, um, then, it, then the, the, and there's a lot of international pressure now to ensure that all trials are published uh, to try and make sure we get all, all the data. Now, the, the question of, of not curing. No, long-term conditions, we almost never cure. Um, so that's where it becomes really critical finding out what matters to the patient. And that's going to vary patient to patient. Um, we had at the NICE conference last year, we had a presentation about a, a woman uh, in her 80s who was on about 12 different drugs. But there was an interview, a recorded interview with this patient. And really, she wasn't bothered about dying. She just didn't want to have a stroke. Her one priority in life was not to have a stroke. And actually, that made a difference to what treatments she was on. And it was possible to stop some of her treatments with her agreement. Because actually, you know, and, and, and for some treatments, there is little evidence that just going on and on and on and on is necessary. So it's a question of talking to the patient. The other thing, I don't know what happens in Bahrain, but in English general practice, frequently when our patients died, we would discover a great sack of drugs that they'd collected over the last five years and not taken. Uh, they'd collected it from the pharmacist, they didn't want to upset anyone, but they hadn't taken them. How much better, how much more sensible to have had a conversation with the patient and allow them to say, do I really need to take these still? You know, someone of, uh, of 90, do I really need to be on these statins still? Do I really need to take this? So focusing on the, the individual patient um, can make a huge difference. But we're not, we're not long-term conditions almost by definition are not there to, to be cured. They're, they're to be there to be managed, and the person you're managing them for is the patient, not you. Probably time for, for one more, unless you're all absolutely exhausted, which I certainly am. So I guess the, the, key, the key message that I wanted to get across was guidelines can be really incredibly important. They are not a, a cookbook that says, add this, do this, do this. They are to provide you with the best possible evidence I hope I've demonstrated why, with us and with many organizations, you can trust that evidence, that they should be used with your patients, um, that it's the, the fact that something has just been done for years doesn't necessarily mean it's the right way forward, that, it, that, that it's evidence that makes the difference, um, and focusing on individual, real human beings, the people you're going to care for, is the really important thing. Can I just finish by wishing you all a fantastic career? Uh, medicine is the most amazing job to be in, and uh, uh, my career has taken me, I wouldn't have predicted any of it, uh, and you won't, you'll have careers that you won't predict either. It's a real privilege. It's a privilege to work with patients. It's a privilege to work with colleagues, and you have such a wonderful place to learn it in. So thank you for having me. And I just want to say thank you. Uh, you've come to Bahrain just for two days, and I know that you've had some very important meetings here. And I just want to say thank you so much for giving us the time here at RCSI to talk to our students. Because what I have learned in the last four years is that this is the best bunch of guys you will find anywhere. Uh, I say that A, because it's true, and B, beca uh, because this is the generation who are going to be looking after you and I. Uh, in not that many years' time. So, Professor Hasman, thank you so very, very much. Thank you.